I want to show some examples now of how um, some of the work that, that, that we do, but also how this, uh, this uh, manifestation of tactical efforts being absorbed into strategic planning frameworks, how um, uh, you know, a whole new generation of uh, bureaucrats, or what we call guerrilla bureaucrats actually, are taking um, the tactical uh, efforts of guerrilla actors, of individual actors, and applying that to achieve longer term, larger scale strategic objectives. So there's this synergy now, I think, between the, the, the kind of uh, two forces. And, um, Can you speak into the mic? Yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, I want to just talk a little bit about, I think um, Rebar started this work in 2005 with Parking Day. <clears throat> and that's when we were, um, Rebar was an avocation for all of us. We all had other jobs. Um, Blaine was working at RHAA, I was working at CMG Landscape Architecture, Matthew was practicing as a lawyer. And in 2009, um, we decided to start our practice full time. So we've been you know, doing stuff for four years or so before we start the practice full time. In that, in that period, you know, um, we, uh, we began to witness this real transformation of the, the work we were doing into being utilized by a, a global set of players um, uh, utilizing these, uh, is, these approaches in what well, now we start to think about as either tactical urbanism or uh, user-generated urbanism. A number of terms are out there that try to define this kind of global movement. And I want to suggest that um, one of the sort of uh, generative forces behind this this uh, emergent movement is um, has to do with the cycle of evolution the cycle of remodeling of, of cities and the rates of evolution of different cultural phenomena so let's let's take for example you know app development you know how long does it take to develop an app several months every several days um, how long does it take to uh, for technology of the automobile to uh, to change, you know, people say it's about ten years. Every ten years or so, there's a radical revolution of automobile technology. How long does it take for cities to evolve? What is the rate of remodeling of urban spaces? I think you know I'm interested to hear what people's thoughts are. But I would say it's on the order of decades. <clears throat> and I think part of what is behind um, ad hoc urbanism, tactical urbanism, is an effort to make the city more resilient and flexible and responsive and adaptable to changing needs in the way that uh, we experience digital culture, in the way that we experience the non-hierarchical, decentralized, and peer-to-peer -peer social structures that now define a lot of culture around the world. Um, <clears throat> and so I think broadly these efforts are about engaging that phenomena of, of cities and the fact that bricks and mortar are difficult to uh, to change and modify. and it's it's. Um, the cycle of evolution of cities is perhaps out of sync sometimes with cultural values, changing cultural values. And, and the, the example of streets that were designed for, you know, primarily valuing traffic flow and movement storage of automobiles, that was a way of thinking about streets that's half a century old now. But to remodel our streets is an enormous investment. And so I think the efforts, some of the efforts we're talking about tonight are about making those kind of changes in a way that don't require a billion dollar investment, a 10 year strategic plan, and, and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go into a couple examples of, one of the terms we use to describe this practice or approach is iterative placemaking. So as opposed to strategic planning, uh, you know, you do a, a, a 10 year master plan, you do a capital campaign, you do community outreach, and then you build a project and then you evaluate it at the end of that project. I think what, uh, what we're seeing in some cases is, is a process that we describe as iterative placemaking, which is um, phase cycles of investment followed by evaluation of shape place over time. This seems to work particularly well in, in sort of horizontal urban spaces. It applies really well, I think, to landscape. Does it apply as well to, to other components of the built environment? I'm not sure. I'd be interested to see what you think, but I've got some examples here where this type of effort is being applied at a much larger scale in cities across the globe. Um, <clears throat> the first example of iter iterative placemaking that I think um, uh, comes from San Francisco with the Pavement of Parks program. This was the very first effort that, by the planning department to implement the ideas coming from Jan Gell and Jeanette Saidi Khan, practice in New York. This was a 72 hour takeover of an urban plaza, a, a long time, a very difficult intersection. 
there's been 10 years of community uh, interest in, in changing the way this space functioned because it was dangerous, it was unpleasant, and finally, um, you know, uh, folks in the planning department said, we're going to take action. We're going to use the tactic of the guerrilla actors and transform the space in a matter of uh, days. And that resulted in a, um, a fairly uh, light, I think, intervention, but enough to claim the space for the pedestrian, enough to um, to demonstrate the idea to the surrounding neighbors, enough to build a, uh, um, some consensus around the value of this kind of space, the value of transforming the use of this space, and uh, enough to result in uh, the Castro Community Benefit District saying, great, we love this spot. You know, city, if you make the physical investment in brick and mortar, we'll agree to maintain it. So it's this kind of uh, um, partnership that evolved, and through this somewhat different process of g getting community feedback, rather than looking at a plan on a wall and putting dots on a, your favorite alternative, the city said, let's make something, see how people respond to it, see what moves are appropriate, what moves don't work, and let's use that to uh, sequence the next phase of, of design um, intervention. So the next phase happened about a year later here at uh, uh, Castro Commons. The first design is called, what's it called, James? Oh, Jane Warner Plaza was the first name. Now it's called Castro Commons. It was designed by Boar Bridges uh, Architecture Firm. And uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting design. They sort of formalized some of the elements in the original design and added some really interesting instruments for flexibility. So there's this um, gate which opens to allow immunity to pass through. So part of the idea here is, in addition to um, innovating new processes for making places, we're also talking about a whole new set of tools that are required to support flexible urbanism, and one of the gates is a real simple example. Um, so that's what we mean by iterative placemaking. I'm going to go to some um, uh, other examples. Who's been to Proxy in San Francisco, up to Hayes Valley? Oh, not that many folks, huh? So um, this is a this is a really interesting. Uh, you know, what does it take to to remodel urban systems? It takes an earthquake in San Francisco to 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 you know, to cause urban change. This is the Central Artery Freeway. And a decade of community uh, uh, um, activism resulted in the finally the, the freeway being removed. <coughs> a 10 year effort to create a master plan for uh, the, 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 the corridor and a variety of kind of parcels along it. And that plan hit the ground. <coughs> I think right in, maybe people can correct me on this, 2006, 2007, right at the sort of uh, cusp of the economic downturn. So great plan. Great ideas, affordable housing, a lot of stuff people were, you know, big support of. None of it moved forward. None of the developers could get their financing. So the Hayes Valley Neighborhood Organization, a very active neighborhood group, was suddenly facing, after going through this rigorous planning effort, the fact that these parcels were now going to sit vacant for who knows how long. So this neighborhood organization wisely advocated for interim use tactical urbanism. Let's do something in the interim to activate these spaces, to test spatial ideas, to incubate program, to create some community benefits before the kind of larger scale, longer term cycle of investment picks back up. So that's what Proxy is. Uh, it's a uh, Doug Burnham envelope A and D submitted a uh, or responded to the RFQ and came up with the city of Proxy, which is a really interesting um, to approach to uh, creating kind of a content machine. So this is this site is going to evolve over the next five years. And uh, right now, um, if you've been there, there's a Smitten Ice Cream. <clears throat> there's a coffee shop. There's an art and craft museum. There's just a new, a new chunk of it hasn't been built. I don't know what's in there yet. But uh, Doug's idea is that this is, this is you know, these content frames, this um, um, uh, shipping container system is going to host a variety of different users over time. One of the things which I think is interesting about this, and it's particularly relevant to Smitten Ice Cream, is that in Hayes Valley now, it would be very tough for a new business to rent commercial real estate on the ground floor in Hayes Valley, right, for a new business. A startup was able to get this space, uh, this container-sized space, and start their business. Now they've built a brand, they've built a following, so one of the possibilities and how this might inf you know, inform the next phase of development is that when this parcel gets built out with its final mixed-use building, Smith and Ice Cream might occupy the ground floor, right? They've built a brand, they've built a reputation, their business has grown. Proxy has incubated a new business, right? That's, that's one of the kind of potentials of 
of, uh, of, of interim use and iterative placemaking. 